Ephra navigated the confusing underground with Ellie on her back, following Ellie's instructions. Ellie had sensed a growing concentration of life force, indicating their proximity to the life fusion. Concerned about Ellie pushing herself without the artificial guideline, Ephra checked on her well-being but Ellie reassured her that her abilities remained intact. Ellie noted Alejandro's subordinates nearby, speculating that they might be unaware of her betrayal. Despite disrupting Alejandro's plans, Ellie worried about their chances of escape. She apologized to Ephra for involving her, but Ephra brushed it off, eager to see Alejandro's reaction when they destroyed the facility. Determined to survive and explore, Ephra had no intention of dying there. Despite being used by Alejandro, they hoped to explain their situation to Atis and even planned a future trip together. Suddenly, a surge of life force caused the ground to shake violently, reopening Ellie's wound. Realizing Atis must be battling Alejandro, they hastened their pace. Ellie sensed a slow release of life force earlier, indicating either a surge of life force from the ground or her injuries were more severe than expected. However, Ephra abruptly halted, questioning their chosen path. Confident that the life fusion lay beyond a giant door, Ellie was puzzled that Ephra had stopped. As Ephra stared at lifeless bodies nearby, she knew that they had all perished if Ellie did not sense any life force in the area. As a giant figure emerged, begging for answers and attacking, they realized it was a half-transformed monster created by Hendy. Before its claws reached them, it was repelled by a blast of flames, causing Ellie and Ephra to be thrown back. Enraged, the monster vowed to destroy them, including the Interrupter, who was revealed to be Atis. Atis attempted to reason with him, but Hendy refused to listen, seeing anyone in his way as an enemy. Meanwhile, above ground, Hanbin continued his fierce battle with Alejandro, effectively blocking his lightning attacks. Alejandro criticized Hanbin's simple fighting style but acknowledged that his strength and speed compensated for any weaknesses. Alejandro attempted to exploit Hanbin's inexperience with lightning wielders, using his magic swordsman's skills to toss Hanbin in the air. He knew that a precise and refined skill would work better on Hanbin than a large skill as he proclaimed to be a PvP expert. Although Hanbin had blocked the incoming attack with a swing of the sword, Alejandro revealed that he was exploiting the opening when Hanbin swung his sword and left himself defenseless for a brief moment. Alejandro launched a powerful lightning spear attack at Hanbin, declaring that it was game over. Alejandro comforted him saying that his friends would soon follow him to his demise after the level 68 underground monsters dealt with them. Hanbin surprised him by breaking his lightning spear with his bare hands. Hanbin revealed his trump card and a tease who could transform into a level 67 dragon. Alejandro initially laughed out loud and proclaimed that Atis won't not be able to turn into a dragon. However, he soon realized that Ellie swiped the necklace from him earlier. Ellie had disabled the necklace and stood in front of her was Atis's true form as a dragon, fighting against the monster Hendi. Atis successfully halted monster Hendi's rampage in his dragon form, urging him to regain control and pushing him towards the room containing the life force fusion. Despite Atis' efforts, Hendy persisted in his frenzied assault, sinking his teeth into Atis' arms. In retaliation, Atis bit Hendy's neck and hurled him against the ceiling, momentarily incapacitating him. Ellie inquired about the ongoing battle above ground and Atis explained that his ally was stalling Alejandro, buying them time to sever his connection to the life force fusion. Atis emphasized the need to prevent the facility's explosion, tasking Ephra and Ellie with locating the means to halt it while he confronted Hendy. Hendy attempted to impede Ephra and Ellie, but Atis intervened, thwarting Hendy's advances. As they approached the fusion core, Ephra suggested destroying the core, but Ellie cautioned against triggering a catastrophic explosion. Instead, they searched for a conduit channeling life force and located a pipe connected to the core. As they rushed towards the pipe, Hendy reappeared, unleashing an energy beam. Atis attempted to intercept it but was too late but Ephra was able to shield Ellie from the attack. Ephra urged Ellie to proceed and she ran towards the pipe to cut it down to disconnect Alejandro from the life force. Simultaneously, Atis and Hendy engaged in a climactic showdown. With Ellie's decisive action, severing the pipe, Atis had also unleashed a powerful fire beam, vanquishing Hendy instantly. The force of the blast left a gaping hole in the ground, signifying the conclusion of their underground confrontation. Meanwhile, the battle between Hanbin and Alejandro escalated, leading them underground. As Alejandro realized the presence of the dragon that they were looking for, he doubted that it could defeat the Lich. As he questioned how Hanbin knew the dragon's level, 
he realized that Han Bin was also an earthling. As he questioned if Han Bin was the one who defeated the Lich, Han Bin asked if he intended to seek revenge for his colleague. Alejandro revealed that he had hated the Lich but were tasked to deal with the one who killed him. When Han Bin asked if he was under the instruction of the demon god, Alejandro clarified that he was actually referring to others who have a lot more influence than the unseen demon god. They had great influence in Rathna and making enemies with them meant he was making the entire continent of Rathna his enemy. Alejandro proposed a deal, offering Han Bin truce in exchange for departing peacefully with his friends. Alejandro would then declare that he had defeated the dragon and claim his rewards with the dragon core in his possession. Han Bin rejected Alejandro's proposal and broke his leg after noticing that he had lost the ability to heal himself. While Han Bin acknowledged that it was a pretty good deal, he realized that Atis wouldn't take it as he hates bad guys. Left with no choice, Alejandro to resort to desperate measures and injected the artificial guideline into his body. Activating the artificial guideline, Alejandro unleashed spikes, pushing Hanbin back and causing his body to disintegrate. In a startling transformation, Alejandro reappeared as a powerful entity. Equipped with blades on his arms and a giant crystal on his chest, fueled by Ormflau's blessing. As Alejandro began to move towards the life force fusion, his increased speed surprised even Han Bin as he swiftly moved past Han Bin. Atis expressed remorse over Hendi's demise, while Ellie and Effer felt relieved by their victory. However, their jubilation was short-lived as Ellie's caretaker emerged, blaming Ellie for ingratitude and ultimately betraying her by stabbing her. Effer cried out for Ellie as she collapsed before they realized that the caretaker was running towards the pipe, attempting to reconnect the severed pipes. Due to the intense surge of power, her body began to disintegrate into dust and it triggered a massive reaction in the life force fusion. As the life force fusion exploded, nearby individuals began losing consciousness. Effer shielded Ellie from the facility's impact as it erupted. Atis hurried towards the fusion, striving to suppress it, though he knew it would only buy them some time. His dragon core enabled him to slightly stabilize the fusion but destroying the massive life force mass before them seemed the only way to restore vitality to the people. Physical attacks proved ineffective, they contemplated triggering an explosion with alternate attacks. Ellie's magic swordsmanship emerged as their sole option, yet her severe injuries had rendered her unconscious, exacerbating their plight. If they stay here any longer, they are all going to be in serious trouble. Back at the fight between Han Bin and Alejandro, Alejandro realized the reasons why they wanted to get Ormflau's blessing. With the Ormflau's blessing, he was able to summon an endless supply of life force to help him regenerate his body. Like the Lich, he could no longer be destroyed by the four powers, prana, mana, aura and force and is equivalent to being immortal. With his heightened perception, he was able to sense the situation in the life force fusion room and was relieved that they were unable to destroy the remaining life force. He aimed to absorb the remaining life force, believing Han been powerless to stop him. Buying time now would only kill Atis and Alejandro will still win. Atis was almost at his limits and he asked Effer to escape with Ellie. As Ellie regained consciousness, Effer, feeling helpless, attempted to stop the fusion core explosion by breathing her fire at the mass of life force but to no avail. Ellie then asked Atis for one last favor. Effer realized that her efforts were not helping at all and hated not being able to be of any use. She hated the thought of being alone any longer but was comforted by Ellie's presence. Ellie said that Effer were more brave and outstanding than she ever expected and brought out the unique necklace she stole from Alejandro. Atis then explained that the item could help a dragon to imitate another species. While Effer was a wyvern and there had never been a wyvern taking a humanoid form, Ellie believed that Effer could do it. With Ellie's trust, Effer was motivated to try it as well as the item was activated and she began to transform. Meanwhile, Han Bin continued his attacks on Alejandro. While he was able to regenerate from any damage dealt by Han Bin, he had underestimated his ferocity and persistence. Despite predicting his attack and reinforcing his body with armor, Han Bin's strength was still able to destroy him with a swing of his sword. With the Ormflau's blessing, Alejandro was able to regenerate his body through the life force despite losing his consciousness for a split second after his body was destroyed. This caused his consciousness to return once more and the pain that coursed through his body as it exploded was still signaled to his brain. While he was going through this suffering, Hanbin had once again made another attack. This endless cycle of suffering repeated itself with Hanbin's relentless attacks. 
Alejandro was worried that he would end up absorbing and using all those remaining life force and decided to check on the situation near the fusion core and noticed something surprising. At the fusion core, Effer's transformation into a humanoid form marked a surprising turn of events, aligning her appearance closely with Ellie's. With emerald eyes ablaze, Effer, now a level 5 magic swordsman, emerged as a pivotal force in the conflict, offering a glimmer of hope amidst the chaos. Effer readied herself, reminiscing about the countless times she had observed people walking on two feet. This transformation marked her first experience as a humanoid, making even the simplest act of walking a daunting task. Despite the initial struggle, with each step forward, she grew increasingly confident, eventually adapting to the bipedal gait. Ellie and Atis marveled at her innate talent, considering that this was her maiden transformation, being able to walk was a feat that even a dragon would take days to master. Ellie continued to offer words of encouragement when their attention was drawn above. The ceiling ruptured, revealing Han Bin engaged in combat with Alejandro, the latter clearly vexed by the confrontation with this formidable opponent. Atis called out to Han Bin, who, upon noticing Effer below, swiftly intervened, rescuing her from the falling debris. As Han Bin carried Effer to safety, she couldn't help but express her frustration of being back to square one after she spent so much effort walking towards the life force fusion. She then bites his arm in a moment of exasperation. To Han Bin's surprise, they revealed her true identity as Effer the Wyvern, leading to a reunion filled with Effer's playful accusations and Han Bin's bewilderment. Upon noticing their interaction, Ellie was relieved that Han Bin seemed to be a decent person, despite her initial skepticism due to his identity as an otherworlder. Meanwhile, Alejandro, besieged by warning notifications from the guideline, sought refuge in the life force fusion, intending to preserve himself by absorbing its energy. Han Bin intercepted his advance with a well-aimed sword throw, determined to thwart his plans. Urged by Han Bin to make her own way, Effer asserted her independence, determined to face the challenge alone. Ellie, though concerned for Effer's well-being, made a solemn promise to await her return. Atis remained impressed that Effer was already able to run. Ellie believed that she might be able to use the magic swordsman's skill since she has great observational skills and was quick-witted. However, Ellie remained very worried for Effer, even though she was still bleeding profusely from her own wounds without others noticing. Han Bin continued his relentless attacks on Alejandro, who realized that his fight with T his monstrous man would be never-ending. He then launched a wide-range attack spikes, hoping to hit Effer and stop her from reaching the life force mass. Effer, drawing inspiration from Ellie's swordsmanship, elegantly dodged Alejandro's attacks, showcasing her newfound agility, remembering the rhythm and the timing of Ellie's dancing steps after watching it countless times. Alejandro, taken aback by their coordinated efforts, found himself outmatched. With Effer poised to deliver the final blow to the life force fusion, Han Bin dealt a decisive strike to Alejandro. As the fusion core erupted in a massive explosion, Alejandro, depleted of life force, disintegrated. The resulting shockwave reverberated through the underground, causing upheaval on the surface. Unbeknownst to the others, Ellie, weakened by her injuries, succumbed to unconsciousness, her necklace slipping from her grasp. Later that day, amidst the heavy rain, Emil arrived with reinforcements from the Order of the Light. The victory they witnessed was perceived as miraculous, evident from the gaping hole in the ground caused by the earlier life force explosion. Many individuals below level 10 regained consciousness as their life force miraculously returned, facilitating a swift recovery. Unfortunately, most fatalities were among those injected with the artificial guideline. Nonetheless, those who thwarted the Great Earth's plans and confronted Alejandro were hailed as heroes. However, their victory wasn't celebrated with a single shout for joy. Effer cradled Ellie's lifeless body, with Han Bin and Atis by her side. The group was ushered to the Order of Light's temple for sanctuary, where they rested for the next three days. Standing before the temple's cringy advertisement, Emil briefed them on the official response to the incident, citing it as an unknown magical disturbance. He expressed regret for being unable to offer them official recognition but assured them of significant rewards for their valor. Atis recognized the complexity of the situation, involving both the Great Earth and the Otherworlders. Han Bin inquired about the public announcement's necessity, prompting Emil to recount the attack on the goddess two decades prior. This event led to intensified persecution of Otherworlders, sparking apprehension in both Atis and Han Bin. Emil revealed that among those targeted, only 30% were genuine Otherworlders, while the rest were innocent Rathnians. 
the nobles had used this opportunity to murder countless people in the name of cleansing the world of the evil demon god. The Order of Light sought to rectify their past mistakes to prevent further atrocities. Descending into the temple's basement, they discovered Effer in a prison cell, guarded by a heresy inquisitor. Emile divulged that Effer would stand trial in ten days before being relocated to the crater camp. With evidence implicating her collaboration with Ellie, Alejandro's subordinate, and potentially possessing the demon god's blessing, Effer faced severe judgment. Atis, outraged by Effer's treatment, implored Emile to reconsider, highlighting their vital role in saving lives. Atis said that she is also important to them and she had just lost her only family. Effer refuted this and said that she doesn't have a family and she wasn't even close to Ellie, who was someone that just looked like her. Emile explained to Atis that he had spoken to Effer and this was the only way. Despite Atis' efforts to reach out, the Inquisitor intervened, warning against interference. Han Bin devised a plan and asked Emile to play along. With his superb acting, he pretended to fall down while knocking down the metal door, crying for help for his broken door. Emile played along and claimed it was due to his injuries from the battle and asked the Inquisitor to carry the unconscious Han Bin out to heal him. Despite their lackluster acting, it created an opportunity for Atis to speak with Effer alone and offer solace to Effer. Expressing gratitude to Atis and Han Bin for their support, Effer downplayed her grief over Ellie's loss. She claimed that she did not know Ellie for long anyway. Despite thinking of their fond memories together, she criticized Ellie's selflessness for staying and saving the lives of others instead of running away to save her own life. Atis comforted her, revealing that a dragon's first transformation dictates their subsequent forms. Effer's current state reflected her deepest desires and affections. Overwhelmed, Effer finally succumbed to tears, mourning Ellie's passing. Outside, Han Bin and Emil felt powerless in the face of Effer's predicament. Han Bin suggested breaking her out, but Emil warned of the consequences. Instead, he proposed earning a pardon through contributions. Since they had already earned much unofficial contributions, they could receive a pardon by completing one more simple mission. This news motivated Han Bin as he asked if there was any mission that could reward them with a lot of contributions. As Emil was unable to leave this place right now, he issued the two of them a mission to subjugate some ghosts. Their next destination, a haunted rundown mansion. Examining the Ormphalus blessing in his hands, Richard observed its instability, recognizing Alejandro's greed in attempting to absorb it. He then commended Leslie for discreetly removing it from the scene without the Order of Light's knowledge. Leslie explained that to ordinary Rathnians, it likely appeared as an ordinary crystal ball, thus evading suspicion. Nonetheless, concerns lingered about potential suspicions from the Order. Leslie pointed out the Order's utilization of Atis and Han Bin in their pursuit, indicating an active investigation into the Great Earth, much to Richard's relief. He expressed gratitude that the Order took charge of the investigation, as heresy inquisitors would have acted more ruthlessly. Despite Leslie's temptation to eliminate the Rathnians with the Ornfulus blessing in their possession, Richard intervened, emphasizing their expendability and that they were only chosen because of their ability to control their killing impulses. He suggested swiftly departing the location before arousing further suspicion. However, Leslie proposed luring hunters to this location through a fabricated mission, allowing them to eliminate them systematically. She delegated the task of managing their unexpected guests to a mysterious figure emerging from the walls, Maiden, another recipient of the artificial guideline. The rundown villa, rumored to be haunted, concealed the secrets of the Great Earth's experiments. To safeguard these secrets, Maiden rigged the mansion with traps, showcasing her expertise. She awaited the arrival of hunters, painting the walls red to intimidate them. However, as days passed without their arrival, she grew anxious, wondering if there were issues with the mission submission. She then prepared the main gate, anticipating their eventual arrival. After several days' delay, the gang finally appeared, delayed by Han Bin's insistence on hunting monsters en route. Tensions flared between Han Bin and Effer who blamed each other for the delay. As they arrived in front of the gate that Maiden had erected, the gang remained unimpressed. While Effer dismissed it as amateurish, Atis appreciated the effort invested in its creation. Maiden, offended by their remarks, vowed to teach them a lesson, targeting Effer first. With no spiritualist in the group that could use the skill to attract immaterial monsters, they resolved to find the ghosts themselves. Effer suggested splitting up to search, prompting Han Bin to caution against the horror movie cliché of separating from the group. 
Han Bin was intimidated by the scary red writings on the wall screaming for help and proposed to head out to wait for them as he was unable to use any of the four energies. Effer suddenly gave Han Bin a poke on his back, giving Han Bin a scare. They then realized that the concept of a ghost might be different in Han Bin's world while Effer continued to mock Han Bin for being afraid of ghosts. They then decided to split up with Effer teaming with Han Bin. As they ventured deeper into the mansion, Effer attempted to lighten the mood with singing, but Han Bin rebuffed her. She then educated him on ghosts' nature as a low-ranking monster that absolves its victims' health and are usually found around monster corpses or humid places. For people who are unable to utilize the four energies, it was recommended to use holy water from the Order of Light to exorcise them. However, as they encountered a hallway of ghosts, Hanbin triggered traps planted by Maiden in his panic as he dashed through the hallway. This prompted Effer to spring into action with her magic swordsmanship. Their argument over Hanbin's overreaction continued. Hanbin insisted on finding a Atis, while Effer assured him of Atis's safety as she criticized the traps as they are too obvious and could only be activated once. Han Bin then teased her about apologizing to the trapper for her criticism. Suddenly, Maiden, enraged at them for destroying her traps, appeared in the hallway, causing Han Bin to freeze. He attempted to flee through a window, leaving effort to confront Maiden alone. However, Han Bin found himself trapped in an infinite loop in the next area, shocking both him and Effer. With four days until Effer's trial, they were trapped in the mansion, facing an uncertain fate. It seems they're trapped in an endless hallway. Effer, gazing at the floating maiden, inquired about Atis. Maiden cheerfully remarked that they must follow her instructions to escape. Effer noted the similarity to dungeon creation, implying that there will definitely be an exit somewhere. Han Bin mentioned that once they locate the dungeon source and artifact, they'd be instantly transported out, rendering finding an exit unnecessary. Maiden elaborated that they needed to overcome tests in each room by finding hidden keys to progress. While Effer found it akin to a treasure hunt, Hanbin likened it to escape rooms from his world, prompting Effer's playful jab about his dating history. Despite Maiden's expectation for them to trigger her traps, Effer effortlessly located the metal key with her force lightning skills, inciting accusations of cheating from Maiden. Nevertheless, Hanbin easily forced open the door in the next room with brute force, leading to accusations of cheating from both Effer and Maiden. The trio proceeded through subsequent rooms with Maiden seeming to relish their company and even assisting them in battle. In this world, mages were rare, with mages surpassing level 40 making up only 2% of all existing hunter. They became hunters to earn money for their education, with most aimed to join the prestigious mage guild Thinkers for magical studies. It is a top-level magic research institute that recruits talented wizards with a focus on the study of magic. Once you become a part of the guild, you can move to the Mage Kingdom and have access to all the latest magical theories. As the member of the Thinker, Atis surmised that the dimensional ceiling magic in front of him was beyond even the guild's knowledge, pondering its origins and purpose. Realizing the magic's deliberate unstable nature, Atis hurriedly left the basement, confirming his fears that the mansion was disappearing. Meanwhile, Maiden, Han Bin, and Effer shared a meal by the campfire, with Maiden revealing her unfortunate background and her loyalty to Leslie and Richard for taking her in when she was starving to death and despised because of her looks. Soon, she realized this strange casual camping atmosphere. Hanbin said that he was hungry and it seemed like they were almost done, even though they had not faced the boss. Maiden was puzzled that they were so calm even though she was trying to kill them, but it was clear that those traps were not fatal and not trying to kill anyone. Despite Maiden's claims that she was keeping them alive just so that she could have some fun, Hanbin knew that she was just lonely and wanted others to acknowledge her. With her artificial guideline, if she had killed a person before, she wouldn't have been able to hold off the temptation to attack them so openly. Effer implored her to abandon the Great Earth's evil ways and leave with them, but Maiden's sudden headache signaled impending danger. The ground began to crumble as the space appeared to be even more unstable than before. Atis's arrival and warning about the trap's nature interrupted their discussion. They had only been moving in and out of just two rooms even though it felt like they had passed through so many rooms. They learned they'd been moving with the source the entire time and needed to destroy it to stop the mansion's disappearance. They soon realized the source was the one person that was moving with them all this time. Maiden, unable to accept that Richard and Leslie would abandon her, attacked them in anger but Han Bin was able to push them away from the attack range. Confident that the attack won't even scratch him, 
Atis continued to search for Maiden while Effa raced towards Han Bin to check on him. Unexpectedly, Han Bin turned his sword towards Effa and launched an attack without warning. As Atis continued to clear away the flying debris, he confirmed his suspicions that the Great Earth was behind this magic. Given their ability to create an artificial guideline, it wasn't far-fetched for them to turn someone into an operating tool. He urgently needed to locate Maiden to prevent the place from being destroyed, realizing she likely sought refuge in a secure location. He soon figured out where she would hide. Meanwhile, the possessed Han Bin swung his sword at Effer, but Atis intervened just in time, using an artifact to levitate them both. Since Han Bin hadn't awakened any of the four energies and Maiden was no ordinary ghost but an intelligent experimental subject, he was vulnerable to possession. Maiden sought to dominate his psyche entirely. Effer attempted to reason with Maiden, urging her to cease her actions and leave with them, but Maiden insisted they must kill Han Bin to stop her. Before she could act, Han Bin managed to regain some control and struck himself, surprising Atis and Effer. It seemed a highly trained physical body could resist magical influence. Han Bin continued to struggle for control, evidenced by the intense external battle and the mental conflict within his mind. In Han Bin's mind and their library of memories, they shared memories. Han Bin's long and dark past in the Rocky Mountains haunted him, facilitating Maiden's possession. However, he retaliated by revealing Maiden's own personal dark history, including memories of a love letter to an imaginary lover. Maiden then countered with the memories of Han Bin's weapon set, while fighting against her own memories of the four great heroes BL fanfic. The battle intensified both internally and externally. Meanwhile, Atis attempted to fashion a device from the debris to extricate them from their predicament. However, the magic's mysterious nature, aided by the artificial guideline, posed a challenge, leading Atis to suspect a spy from the great earth within thinkers. As a mirror cracked in the mansion, the other mirror of entanglement held by Leslie broke as well, indicating that someone had taken the bait. While Leslie was initially sad to lose one of their magic tools, Richard reminded her that they were meant to be used for their missions. Leslie and Richard, in disguise, made their way through the Magic Kingdom, Rune. They needed to avoid the crowd that had gathered to attend the Magic Symposium as, that person, won't want them to be noticed by others. They had arrived at the first branch of the Mage Guild Thinkers, where the Magic Symposium would take place. The event, which started off as a magic lecture transformed into a showcase of wealth and prized magic tools by the nobles. Evading detection, they encountered a golem monster, which Richard swiftly destroyed with his aura blade. Analyzing the remains, Leslie realized its artificial nature just as Zenovia, the archmage of the four heroes, appeared. Upset about the destruction of her golem and lab, she demanded their report be worthwhile, reminding them of the gravity of their task. Maiden found herself in an unfamiliar place, initially mistaking it for hell and fearing she had died. However, she felt relieved at this fact as it meant that the rest had escaped the mansion and survived the encounter. She reflected on the fun she'd had and was glad that they had survived and she had avoided a painful death. Suddenly, a dog appeared, urging her to stop lamenting and warning her to keep moving, lest she face dire consequences. She realized she was still within Han Bin's consciousness, witnessing the fading road behind them and the menacing pit below. Recognizing the danger, Maiden swiftly exited Han Bin's psyche, narrowly avoiding being consumed by his trauma, despair, and anger. Unaware that Atis had ensnared them within a magical circle, Maiden departed Han Bin's body and Atis immediately triggered a spell, resulting in a massive explosion. Upon awakening the next morning, they realized they'd been unconscious for an entire day. While glad that they survived, they realized that they were running out of time and wouldn't be able to reach Effer's trial on time. Maiden, now restored to her normal self, remained skeptical of their intentions despite Atis's explanation. Effer's insistence on saving her, even at the expense of Effer's own trial, did not convince Maiden. However, Effer revealed that she also had a friend who was also used by Great Earth like Maiden and this was her way of fighting against them. She would fight to survive even if it meant she had to go to prison. This revelation touched Maiden. As they debated, Maiden proposed a solution. She showed them a tarpy, a magical golem carriage that was powered by a magic engine using mana stones. As a mage, Atis was very impressed with this beauty, which was left behind by the mansion owner a long time ago. Atis then realized that they required a high-ranked mana stone to power the engine. 
Han Bin's revelation of a fragment of the Ormflau's blessing sparked hope for powering the Tarpi. As they sped across the desert to reach the crater prison camp in time for Effer's trial, Maiden complained as they brought her along on the Tarpi despite her objections. As Atis thought of the Ormflau's blessing's connection to the thinkers, Han Bin questioned if he could just report to the leader since he was also part of thinkers. However, Atis said it was impossible as the leader was one of the four heroes, Zenovia, the Archmage. She was one of the strongest mages alive who saved the world by stopping the attack on the goddesses and is also the king of the mage kingdom Rune. Many noblemen wanted to wet her due to her beauty and it would be impossible for them to get close to her. Han Bin was surprised at this as he thought she would be old since the event was twenty years ago. Atis then explained that for their good deeds, the four heroes were blessed with immortality and their bodies would never grow old. Han Bin vaguely recalls hearing some stories of the four heroes from Ephor in the past. Since this is common knowledge, Atis began to tell him more about them. As a Valtyrian, Han Bin would need to know about the continent's strongest swordsman, Barolt the Sword King, who was the strongest of the four. He was the one who created the current image of the Valtyrian but no one has seen him in recent years. Halian was a spiritualist and of the spirit species and was the strongest nymph and she was currently the queen of Alandia, the spirit kingdom. The last hero was the top magic swordsman, Garhan the Terrible who hunted more otherworlders than anyone and is the regent and real monarch of Kalduri the kingdom. They each represented a kingdom and when they gathered, it would either be a place where war was taking place or a place of great importance. Zenovia, Garhan and Halian had made an appearance at the magic symposium but at the break room. It was revealed that Halian did not appear herself and her body double reported that she would accept any decision that the other two made. With the Ornflau's blessing in Zenovia's possession, they orchestrated a plan to confront the goddess of darkness, Kivriel. As they called for Kivriel, Kivir, the embodiment of the goddess of darkness, answered their prayers and summoned them to the altar in the world of darkness. When Kivir inquired about their purpose here, Garhan defiantly severed her head, setting their plan into motion. As Garhan suddenly struck Kivir, she demanded their true purpose as it became clear they sought more than just answers. Garhan recounted their sacrifice two decades ago, where they had exhausted their bodies in service to the goddesses. Despite their valor, they were granted the goddesses' blessing but were cursed with a countdown to their demise, each moment a reminder of their mortality. Kivriel, underestimating their greed and ambition, had assumed they'd forsake immortality after receiving such high honors. Amidst Kivir's clones, Garhan denounced the passivity of the goddesses, who watched as Rathnians perished in the battle against demons. Kivriel explained that they had only lived for a fraction of time and were only able to see the chaos in front of their eyes and not the whole truth of the universe. As Garhan dispatched the clones, they declared that they had no need for gods that just spectate but required a hero that punishes evil and sustains justice. He then proclaimed their intent to become immortal pillars of justice, demanding immortality to protect the world themselves. However, Zenovia's body began to disintegrate, signaling their impending demise. Kivriel offered them a painless death, preserving their heroism for posterity. As Garhan's form faded, they called out to the betraying goddesses. Back at the crater courthouse, they arrived just in time. Atis concealed Maiden's connection to the Great Earth, presenting her as a mere victim turned ghost. With multiple encounters with the Great Earth, they aimed to avoid suspicion from the Order. Despite possessing the Ormflau's blessing fragment, they opted to conceal its existence for the time being. Transforming the fragment into a specialized guideline, they marveled at its potential to surpass their magical limits. Han Bin likened it to an advanced computer, enabling them to execute complex magic beyond their innate abilities. As Atis continued to worry about the challenges that they faced, Han Bin reminded him to appreciate the fact that they had survived all those challenges so far. Snap out of his depression by Han Bin's optimistic perspective, Atis acknowledged the importance of living in the present. Effer and Maiden emerged, with Effer being exonerated due to the evidence provided by Maiden. However, witnessing the earlier altercation led to a misunderstanding, prompted Effer to attack Han Bin. The trio has now united back again and engaged in their usual banter. In another dimension, scenes of the hero's earlier battle against Kivriel unveiled a plan to trap her. As the goddesses existed in another dimension, they were unable to attack the goddesses, until now. With the dimension sealing magic that they had created, Garhan and Zenovia were able to seal Kivriel within a dimension and the earlier scene was merely a possible future that she can see. 
By sealing her, the future will continue to repeat itself in the sealed space. With the Ormflau's blessing, they were able to entrap Kivriel within an eternal loop and had absorbed half of her darkness power. As long as they stayed in this neutral space that had no concept of time, they could take their time to absorb the rest of it without diminishing their lifespans. Garhan was able to masquerade as the goddess of darkness using the power that they had just absorbed and proposed using their newfound ability to manipulate the outside world, including commanding the Dark Brotherhood under Kivriel's name. At the Hunter Guild, Effer proudly brandished her new badge, while Atis facilitated her registration in addition to his party. The receptionist offered to help to pay for the registration since Emil owed them a debt. Spotting a newcomer, Hanbin noted his pristine equipment in level 20. When he declared that he was trying to register as a new hunter, Hanbin had a bad feeling about this. When asked about his name and where he came from, the newcomer proudly said that he came from Shanghai and he is Sana the warrior.